the origins of nations by george rawlinson chapter one it is commonly assumed at the end at the present day that civilization is a plant of slow and gradual growth which developed itself by degrees in the course of ages and which belongs consequently to a comparatively late period of the world's history. The primeval savage is a familiar idea, and the so-called science of the day is never tired of presenting before us the primitive race of man as only a little removed from the brutes, devoid of knowledge, devoid of art, devoid of language, and a creature in few respects elevated above and in many sunk below the anthropoid apes from whom it is held that he derived his descent by way of evolution. Occasionally, indeed, a confession is made, parenthetically and by the way, that there is no proof of this supposed priority of savagery to any form of civilization. And it is admitted to be questionable which of the two preceded the other. But this confession, hurriedly uttered and hastily slurred over in most cases, makes little impression on the public mind, and the belief is general that in some way or other, science has proved that the first men who inhabited the earth were savages, and that there was no civilization till a comparatively recent period. But the question is one which is really quite an open one. It is one on which natural science is quite incompetent to pronounce a judgment, and on which historical research has not hitherto decided in either way. Natural science, of course, if it assumes the doctrine of evolution and applies that doctrine to man, must have or must give the precedence to savagery, which is manifestly more congenial than civilization to the anthropoid ape. But if the doctrine of evolution is recognized as a mere hypothesis, one out of many theories as to the mood in which things that are have been brought into the state in which they are, and a theory which lacks altogether any confirmation from fact then science has to confess that she can give no decision on the point in question, but must leave in it to the judgment of those who are familiar with historical facts. Now, historic facts show that either of the two movements is possible. Man can, and thus often perhaps most usually, pass from the savage into the civilized condition. We have numerous instances of this transition which we can follow step by step and put transition and put as it were under a metaphysical microscope. We see the Greek pass from the simple semi-savage state described by Homer to the condition of high civilization placed before us by Theosidites and Xenophon. We see the Romans gradually exchange the robber life of the 8th century BC for the splendor of the Augustan age or the paler but purer radiance of the court of the Antonines. In later times, we observe the Arab hordes issuing from the desert unkempt and almost naked with no literature but confused jumble known as the Quran no arts but those of forging iron and weaving a coarse cloth and we trace their progress from this rude condition to the glories of the baghdad caliphate and the magnificence of granada all over western europe we see the barbarous races which overran and crushed the roman empire settling down into a less wild and savage life adopting the arts as well as the religion of the conquered and gradually emulating or surpassing the civilization which at their first becoming they destroyed. In our time, or in our own time, 
and before our eyes a civilizing process is going on in Russia and in Turkey. Serfdom disappears, nomadic tribes become settled. The arts, the habits, even the dress of the neighboring nations are in course of adoption and the Mus Muscovites and Turkic hordes are becoming scarce, distinguishing, distinguishable from other Europeans. But while this is the more ordinary process, or at any rate, the one which most catches the eye when it grows at, eye at large over the historic field, there are not wanting indications that the process is occasionally reversed. Herodotus tells us of the Jaluni, a Greek people who, having been expelled from the cities in the northern coast of Uzine, had retired into the interior and there lived in wooden huts and spoke a language half Greek, half Scythian. By the time of Mela, these people had become completely barbarous and used the skins of those slain by them in battle as covering for themselves and their horses. A gradual degradation of the Greco-Bactrian people is apparent in the series of their coins, which is extant and which has been carefully edited by the late Professor H. H. Wilson and by Major Cunningham. We trace a certain degeneration in the Jews of the post-Babylonian period if we compare them with their compatriots from the accession of David to the captivity of Zedekiah. The modern Copts are very degraded descendants of the ancient Egyptians and the Romans of Wallachia have fallen away very considerably from the level of Dacian colonists of Trajan. In America, both North and South, the modern descendants of the Spanish conquerors are poor representatives of the Castilian gentlemen who under Cortes and Pizarro made themselves masters of Mexican and Peruvian kingdoms, introduced into the new world the time-honored civilization of the old. Civilization, as is evident from these and various other instances, is liable to decay, to wane, to deteriorate, to proceed from bad to worse in course of time, to sink to so low a level that the question occurs, is it civilization any longer? But still, perhaps a doubt may be entertained whether the relapse can be complete, whether this is to say any people who has once participated in a high Civilization can ever, under any circumstance, be reduced to absolute savagery. In most of the cases that have been quoted, while a certain deterioration has taken place, the end has not been actual savagery or barbarism, but rather a low and degraded form of civilization, retaining traces of some, something higher and something cons considerably raised above the condition of the absolute savage. Are there any cases, it may be asked, when the degradation has proceeded beyond this, where a civilized race has last, lapsed into complete and absolute barbarism? Now, it is exceedingly difficult. It is almost, if not quite impossible, to trace such cases. So long as contact with civilization remains, the degeneration will not be extreme. Savagery can only be reached when there is a complete separation from the civilized mankind and at the same time such a condition of the physical circumstances demands the concentration of all mental power on efforts to support life. But in such cases there is, of course, no record. The race, tribe, nation has passed beyond the ken of its civilized neighbors and has no time to spare for recording its own history. It loses all knowledge of the past, all power of noting events, and if in, in, after, in after time it is so bold as to venture an account of its origins, the narrative is evolved from the inner consciousness in pure fancy and has no claim to be regarded as even built or any historical foundation. 
complete and continuous historical evidence, therefore, of such a degeneration as we are now speaking of is not to be looked for, and we must be content to accept a sufficient proof of what is so difficult to be proved evidence of a lower kind. Now, comparative philology does present to us cases where there is reason to presume an original participation in a high civilization. Though the present condition of the race is almost the lowest conceivable. An instance of this kind is furnished by the very curious race still existing in Ceylon and known as the Wedas. The best comparative philologists pronounce the language of the Wedas to be a debased descendant of the most elaborate and earliest known of the Aryan speech, the Sanskrit. And the Wedas are on the ground, on this ground, believed to be degenerate descendants of Sanskritic Aryans who conquered India. If this be indeed so, it is difficult to conceive of a degeneration which could be more complete. The Sanskritic ions must be, must by their language and literature have been at the time of their conquest in a fairly advanced stage of civilization. The Widas are savages of a type than which it is scarcely possible to conceive any more, more debased. Their language is limited to some few hundred vocables. They cannot count beyond two or three. They have, of course, no idea of letters. They have domesticated no animal but the dog. They have no arts beyond the power of making bows and arrows and constructing huts of a very rude kind. They are said to have no idea of God and scarcely any memory. They with difficult difficulty obtain a dwindling and threaten to become extinct. In height, we rarely exceed five feet. They rarely exceed five feet and are thus degenerate both physically and intellectually. Thus, on the whole, there would seem to be grounds for believing broadly and that savagery and civilization, the two opposite poles of our social condition, are states between which men oscillate freely, passing from either to the other with almost equal ease, according to the external circumstance wherewith they are grounded. If the circumstances become ameliorated, if life becomes less of a struggle, if leisure be obtained, civilization as a general rule grows up. If these conditions are reversed, if the struggle of the, for existence tends to occupy the whole attention of each man, civilization disappears. The community becomes barbarized and the savage condition is reached. What then does history say as to the priority of the one state or the other? History no doubt shows abundant instances of improvement of an advance from a comparatively low condition to a higher one, of civilization developing itself out of a savage or a semi-savage state and gradually progressing until it arrives at a sort of quasi-perfection. But what does the earliest history say as to the earliest condition of mankind? Does it record with the bulk of those who write the accounts now so common of prehistoric man? Does it make the primeval man a savage or something very remote from a savage? To us, it seems that so far the voice of the history speakers at all, it is in favor of a primitive race of man, not indeed equipped with all the arts and appliances of our modern civilization, but substantially civilized, possessing language, thought, intelligence, conscious of a divine being, quick to form the conception of tools and to frame them as it needed them, early developing, developing many of the useful and elegant arts and only sinking to degrees and under peculiar circumstances into the savage condition. In proof of this, we shall allege first and foremost 
that sacred record which is even hum humanly speaking one of the most vulnerable fragments of antiquity that has come down to us the opening section of genesis chapters 1 to 4. in this section we find our first parents represented much as milton has drawn them to two of far nobler shape erect and tall godlike erect with naked honor clad in naked majesty seemed lords of all and worthy seemed for in their looks divine the image of their glorious maker shone truth wisdom sanctitude and severe and pure severe but in true filial freedom placed whence true authority in men no savages are this simple pair but clever intelligent quick to invent able to sew themselves coats on the first perception of the need of them able during their innocence to enjoy high converse with god and with each other able to suggest to their children the two chief modes of life by which subsistence is readily procured in simple times the pastoral and the agricultural no gradual working onward with toil and pain from the life of hunter to that of a shepherd and from the life of the shepherd to that of the cultivator is set before us the two sons first born to the first man are respectively a tiller of the ground and a keeper of sheep genesis chapter 2 again the primeval race does not find a shelter in hollow trees in caverns neither does it burrow underground like some tribes of africans the eldest son of the first man builded a city not of course a Nineveh or a Babylon but still a city a collection of habitations permanent fixed fitted together by human skill a sufficient protection against extremes of heat and cold or against storms of rainy weather later not earlier than this the tent is invented and then while the first man is still alive instrumental music comes into being the harp and flute are framed by skillful hands and the pastoral life is en enlivened by the charms of melody copper and iron are smelted at the same period and a race of artificers in metal grows up which produces tools and weapons of war perhaps also works of artistic beauty such is the account given in one of the earliest historical records that has come down to us a record whose historical value is not diminished by the fact that according to general belief of the jewish and christian worlds it is inspired we proceed to consider whether the record is in accordance or not with such historical evidence as exists upon the point in question now it will scarcely be denied that the mythical traditions of almost all nations place at the beginning of human race a time of happiness perfection a golden age which has no features of savagery or barbarism but many of civilization and refinement in the zendavesta yimakashaita jemshid the first iron king after reigning for a time in the original ironem virgil removes with his subjects to a scheduled spot where both he and they enjoy uninterrupted happiness in the in this place was neither overbearing nor mean-spirited neither stupidity nor violence neither poverty nor deceit neither punniness nor deformity neither huge teeth nor bodies beyond the usual measure the inhabitants suffered no defilement from the evil spirit they dwelt amid odoriferous trees and golden pillars their cattle were the largest best and most beautiful on the earth they were themselves a tall and beautiful race their food was ambrosia and never failed them the chinese peak of a first heaven an age of innocence 
when the whole creation enjoyed a state of happiness, when everything was beautiful, everything was good, all beings were perfect in their kind. Mexican tradition tells of the golden age of Tezuco, and Peruvian history commences with two children of the sun who established a civilized community of borders of Lake Titicaca. The elegant imaginations of the Greeks described the first age as follows. In quotations, source from the Hesiod, the immortal gods that trend the courts of heaven first made of a golden race of mortal men like gods they lived with happy careless souls from toil and pain exempt nor on them crept wretched old age but all their life was passed in feasting and their limbs were limbs no changes new not evil came them nigh and when they died twas but as if they were overcome by sleep all good things were their portion. The fat soil bare them, its fruits spontaneous, fruits ungrudged and plentiful. They at their own sweet will, pursued in peace the tasks that seemed them good, laden with blessings rich in flocks and dear to the great gods. End of quotation. Such is the voice which reaches us on all sides from that dim and twilight land where the mythical and the historical seem to meet and blend together inseparably. Can we go at all beyond this? Can we say that historical history that history proper tells us everything anything upon the subject or leans at all to one side of the question rather than the other? It is plain that there are very few nations which even profess to have a history that goes back to the beginning of all things. Of the few which make such a profession, some like the Chinese and the Hindus appear upon inquiry to do so without any valid ground. There are real histories commencing not very long before the Christian era. Others may perhaps have more reason for the claims which they urge. Egypt and Babylonia have moments to show which antedate probably all others upon the earth's surface. If real history is to have anything to say with the regard to the problem before us, it is to Egypt and Babylonia that we must look for light upon the vexed question. Now, in Egypt, it is notorious that there is no indication of any early period of savagery or barbarism. All the authorities agree that however far we go back, we find in Egypt no root or uncivilized time out of which civilization is developed. Menes, the first king, changes the course of the Nile, makes a great reservoir, and builds the temple of Tha at Memphis. Anthotis, or Tosomos, his son, and successor is the builder of the Memphite palace and a physician who wrote books on anatomy. The pyramid period falls very early in Egyptian history, but the scenes depicted in the tombs of this epoch show that the Egyptians had already the same habits. This is an asterisk, just note. The finding by Dr. Schliemann and others of traces of an earlier platform of life below the first civilization of Greece or Asia, Minor, so far from proving the occurrence of a very long lapse of years during which the same people slowly progressed from savagery into civilization proves exactly the contrary. There was occupation by barbarians, the nomads of offshoots or offshoots of population elsewhere there may have been occupation by them for some considerable time. There was some improvement in the apparatus of life, but all this was superseded suddenly by the advent of more civilized conquerors who in their turn occupied and flourished and were again displaced 
in one case by a less civilized community but usually by people better armed accoutred and accoutred the layers of monumental remains are successive but not in the succession of single series but of successive displacements there is no single case in case in cast or or in east sorry or west of steady uninterrupted progress from barbarism to civilization and therefore the theory of time proposed to be based on this has literally no foundation back to the text and the hieroglyphics in the great pyramid proved that writing had lo been long in use we see no primitive mode of life in Egypt, no barbarous customs, not even the habit so slowly abandoned by all people of wearing arms when not on military service, nor any archaic art. In the tombs of the pyramid period are represented the same fowling and fishing scenes as occurred later. The rearing of cattle and wild animals of the desert the scribes using the same kind of read for writing on papyrus as inventory of the of the estate which was to be presented to the owner the same boats though rigged with a double mast instead of a single one of latter times the same mode of preparing for the entertainment of guests the same introduction to music and dancing the same trades as glass blowers cabinet makers and others as well as similar agricultural scenes and implements and granaries in Babylonia there is more indication of early rudeness the bricks of the most ancient buildings are coarsely made the vases found in them are clumsy and irregular in shape and implements in the flint and stone are not uncommon but on the other hand there are not wanting signs of advanced state of certain things even in the very earliest times which denote a high degree of civilization and contrast most curiously with the indications of rudeness here spoken among the objects recovered are the cylinder seals of monarchs who are long the most ancient of the th series and on their scales on their seals which are of hard stone every difficult very difficult to engrave we have in the first place a primitive form of cuneiform writing and secondly elaborate representations of men wearing elegant flounced or fringed robes and with crowns on their head and in one case we have a representation of an elegant chair or throne the hind legs of which are modeled after the leg of an animal mechanical and artistic skill has thus had thus, it is evident, reached a very surprising degree of excellence, and the engraving of hard stones, probably with steel and emery, was practiced, and writing was in con constant and familiar use. At most, at almost the very remotest period to which the Babylonian records carry us back. A question of considerable interest presents itself with respect to these earliest forms of civilization, the most remote where to history carries us back. What is their prob probable date? Can we fix definitely or within certain limits the chronology of Egypt and Babylon? Or must such matters be left in the shadowy vagueness in which writers on prehistoric men love to indulge when they deal with the origins of the human race? We propose to examine this question the next and following chapters and if we are not mistaken we shall be able without very much difficulty to dispel an illusion fostered by some great names that the present state of our historical knowledge requires an enormous expansion of the ordinary as ordinarily accepted chronology an expansion as some suppose of 4,000 to 10,000 15,000 or even 20,000 years some expansion of what has been called the authorized chronology, though it is not authorized, may be necessary. But such enlargements as have been proposed are, it is believed, excessive. 
there, there being no sufficient evidence to justify them. And the general results of historical inquiry up to the present time being such as to render them highly improbable. End of chapter 1.